welcome back. We appreciate you being here. Um, so today we're going to have a presentation by Dr. Jenkins, so let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Dr. Jenkins was born in, uh, and raised in Pocala, Florida. Uh, he received his bachelor's, his bachelor's science degree in biology from Florida a and University in Tallahassee, and his master's and PhD degree in animal and avian science from the University of Maryland at College Park, Maryland. Uh, upon finishing up with his doctorate work, Dr. Jenkins continued with his research with uh, two postdoctoral appointments in addition. Uh, Dr. Jenkins first worked at the uh, Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center on the campus of uh, Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., where he studied uh, the signaling, signaling pathways that are responsible for the pathology of uh, Neoblastoma, multiforming, multiforming yeah. a type of brain cancer. Upon finishing his work at Georgetown, Dr. Jenkins continued with his postdoctoral studies at Villanova University. There, he also began his teaching career with an intro to biotechnology class while performing research in the introduction of apoptosis, cell death, apoptosis. Apoptosis, <laughs> which is cell death through liquid rats. Today, Dr. James Jenkins has co-authored and authored several articles which appear in such journals of, as Cancer Research and Endocrinology. In the fall semester of 2012, Dr. Jenkins joined the NCSC community as an assistant professor in the biology and chemistry department. Uh, his current research interests are studying the mechanism utilized by cancer cells to invade programmed cells that Apoptosis. Dr. Jenkins, uh, today Dr. Jenkins will be talking about part of his research pursuit using C. elegans as an animal model. So, welcome Dr. Jenkins. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm so glad to see a good percentage of my students here. Uh, I guess you guys want the extra credit badly enough, so. <laughs> We decided to sit, sit with me for an hour. So today, um, I'm going to present um, some research that's been done, not by me personally, but by others in a field that I'm very interested in establishing here um, in the biology department. Um, so I'm going to talk about how an animal model called C. elegans is uh, used for the study of obesity in human beings. Right. So I'm sure most of you know that in our country, there's one third of the American population are overweight. Another one third are considered um, what's called obese. Okay, so a combined 68% of the American population are overweight and obese. And actually, obesity carries, carries with it certain health risks, such as uh, heart disease, cancer, um, heart attacks. Um, and other, other types of diseases, so obesity is a contributing factor to five out of the top ten deaths um, that occur in our country. Also, obesity carries with it a high cost risk, okay? So at the current rate of um, increase, obesity-related health care costs are expected to exceed $300 billion by 2018. Someone who has diabetes, on the average, costs um, a little more than $6,000 per year to care for. Collectively, diabetes in our country costs us taxpayers roughly $150 billion per year. Um, also, someone who is obese costs, on average, $1,400 per year to care for. Um, and this is also very interesting in the fact that Obesity tends to run in populations of low income. So obviously $1,400 in that particular group means a lot, okay? Well, it means a lot to a lot of people too, so. Um, also, obesity in the workplace, uh, those, those people who are obese tend to be not promoted as quickly as their non-obese counterparts. Also, obesity-related um, 
absenteeism from work um, usually costs employers roughly $6.4 billion a year. So basically, we have a problem that we have to address in our country of obesity. So finding a solution to obesity, this obesity epidemic, um, in a fast and very cost-efficient way has garnered a lot of research um, in our country. NIH, which is the um, National Institutes of Health, which uh, funds a lot of the biomedical research in our country, has invested billions of dollars to study um, ways to you know, help us cure this obesity epidemic that we have in the USA. So obesity basically comes about when basically the calories that you imbibe or consume far exceed the calories that you burn off through your basic metabolic rate. Now it's a complex um, trait, okay? There's not just one gene that's responsible for obesity. There are multiple factors that are responsible for obesity. Um, obviously, the genetic makeup can leave you predis pre predisposed to obesity, all right? Depending on your genetic makeup, two people who are the same age, height, um, and consuming the same amount of calories can actually turn out to look very, very different. Okay, I'm sure some of you have friends who are skinny as whales but eat like goats and don't seem to gain any weight. Okay, so that's usually they have a genetic, um, their, their genes are basically active where they keep burning off the calories they consume so they never seem to gain any weight. Obviously, there are people who do eat very little but seem to put on the pounds, as they say. So obesity is just not simply, simply people just overeating all the time. All right, there are multi multitude of factors that do um, play a part in developing obesity. All right, so um, your body has various mechanisms of regulating the sugar and fat breakdowns. Um, fats in human beings are stored in cells called adipocytes. And usually these adipocytes will send signals to the brain that's supposed to alter your food intake. Okay. I'm going to show you a couple of the diagrams where we're going to talk about various hormones that are responsible for either burning fat or synthesizing fat. Um, adipose tissue, as I stated, is where your fat is stored in the human body. The adipose tissue is also an endocrine gland. Okay, endocrine glands are those glands that secrete hormones into the bloodstream. So leptin is actually a protein hormone secreted by adipose tissue and it's supposed to act on nerves in the um, hypothalamus to actually decrease your food intake. Okay, but obviously with human beings, our uh, eating behavior is a lot more complex. Okay, so even, even those times when we feel full, we still sometimes we still seem to keep on eating. Okay, or if something tastes real good to us. Um, obviously, stuff like sweets. Obviously, um, we seem to be able to override. Um, hormonal inputs to tell us to stop eating. Okay. So um, again, there are various hormones. I apologize for the picture; it looks a lot clearer on my laptop. Um, so there are various hormones that control eating. Insulin, which is secreted from the pancreas, actually in response to glucose intake. So after you eat a meal, your insulin levels usually spike up. And that's usually to tell your body, hey, you know, you're eating enough, so stop eating. Um, there's also other hormones, such as ghrelin, which are produced from the stomach. And actually, when you're hungry, ghrelin is secreted by the stomach, and it goes into the bloodstream, enters your brain, and tells you to start eating as well. Um, other hormones include uh, neuropeptide Y, uh, again, which inhibits, which, which should inhibit food intake. And also, there are various nerves, neural signals that actually regulate eating. Um, when you eat food and it gets into your stomach, your stomach actually starts to distend or open up, and the nerves connect it to your stomach. And so, as your stomach distends, it actually sends a nerve signal to your brain to tell you, hey, you know, we're full. Okay, so you should stop eating. So, there are various hormones and neural input that will regulate your um, eating behavior. All right. So, the typical obesity research animal, 
of the mice and rats. Okay. Um, this is a picture of a mouse that has had a gene called obese removed. So this mouse is, I'm sure my genetic students can tell me, homo, homozygous, right. <laughs> homozygous for the obese gene. So these mice with this obese gene removed actually just continue to eat, 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 eat until they eat themselves to death. Okay, so you can see this is a obese mouse. This is a normal mouse. Obviously there's a size difference between the two. And so it was discovered that obese, the OB gene actually is a gene that makes leptin that I talked about previously. Okay. So again, the um, Typical, the traditional animal model for obesity are mice and rats. Now, the disadvantages to using mice and rats. All right. Mice and rats have a lifespan that can be measured in years. All right. Out in the wild, usually the lifespan is about two years. That's mostly due to predation. In the lab, mice can live up to three years. Okay. So. That's a major disadvantage, especially if you're on a time clock, you're trying to get a research grant, but because of the lifespan of mice, you don't have to wait, okay? Oops. Now, genetic manipulations of mice are labor-intensive and time-intensive, okay? It can usually take up to a year to make a gene knockout line of mice, and this can actually cost you tens of thousands of dollars to do, and this is just for one gene. And so mice have tens of thousands of genes. So if you're studying multiple genes, you can see how that cost can add up. So I'm sure most of you probably wondering what the heck is on the back of this mouse. He has the ear. <laughs> but actually, um, mice are um, often um, mutated so that their immune system don't reject tissue. So these are called mood mice. So they, their thymus is being removed so they don't have a functioning immune system. So as a result, you can grow other tissues on the mice. So when that happens, because they don't have an immune system, the mice won't reject the tissue. Okay. So, but the you know, main point I want to come across tell you that genetic, genetically manipulated mice is a very time and labor intensive uh, process. Also, when you work with mice, rats, um, fish, or uh, any obviously human beings, um, any vertebrate animal. In order to do research with vertebrate animals, the research project or protocol has to be approved by what's called an animal care and use committee. Okay. Um, most place, most universities and colleges that have active research programs on their campus that use vertebrate animals in their research have these committees. Okay. So usually these committees are made up of people in the biology department with a couple of people outside of the department, and so. The purpose of these committees are to make sure that your research animals are being used in the most humane way possible. Okay. But obviously when you have to work with committees, that takes time. Okay. The committees have to get together, they have to approve your protocol. If you know they don't approve your protocol, you have to that's it. They'll tell you you have to go change the protocol. Then you gotta schedule another meeting to Either, re re either approve or disapprove of your submitted, I mean, resubmitted protocol. So you can see how working with committees takes time. All right. Um, a couple of faculty members in here, they can tell you that working, working with committees is usually not a very efficient um, process. Okay. So obviously, that's a disadvantage with using rodents. Last disadvantage housing and care for rodents can be very expensive. Okay. Um, Especially if you have a lot of mice um, that you have to care for. So usually, a lot of times you have to ha hire somebody to actually take care of your mice. So you got to pay that person a salary, obviously, and got that person has to have benefits and so forth. So you can see how caring for mice can actually cost uh, a little bit of money here. So what's needed is a model that's less expensive to care for. Also, that's more time efficient as far as answering the research questions that you want um, answered. Okay, so this animal, C. noor hepatitis. 
That's how you pronounce that word, just in case you're wondering. Senior Hepatitis Elegans, or most commonly called C. Elegans, all right, is the research model that um, the other thieves here also hope to um, again st start a research program here on campus. For C, the C. Elegans will reduce, it's hope hopefully will reduce the time that's required to study various research questions. Also, it provides a very inefficient model to um, to study various biological processes. Okay, these animals are um, less than a millimeter in length, right? And they can be grown in very small petri dishes, like this size. Those of you who are my plants and animals have done transformation experiments. Those petri dishes, those same petri dishes can be used to grow sea elegans. Okay. So on that, on that petri dish, you can actually have thousands of worms, okay, just in one single petri dish. You can have thousands of worms. Obviously, there are a thousand mice in front of you right now. I'm sure this room would clear very quickly. But on a single petri dish, you can have thousands and thousands of worms. So C. elegans belongs to the fire nematoda. These are your round worms, okay? Some of your round worms are paras parasitic. Other than non parasitic, C. elegans lives in the soil, so it's actually non parasitic. Um, the N2 strain, which is the wild type strain, has a lifespan of about 21 days, right, and a life cycle of about three days. Okay? It reaches adulthood within two days after hatching, so it grows very quickly. Um, and so the C. elegans comes in two different genders. One is the hermaphrodite, seen here. I'm sure most of you know hermaphrodites have both what, male and female organs. Also, another gender is just the male. Okay, so the male is usually much smaller than the hermaphrodite. Um, so the hermaphrodite by itself can produce about 300 progeny, but when it's inseminated by a male, it can produce about more than 1,000 progeny. Okay. So again, that's a very, very useful tool with a short lifespan, and it produces a lot of progeny. Okay, um, the life cycle, as I stated before, um, C. elegans goes from an egg to an L1 larva stage uh, within eight hours, and then goes to an L2 larva stage um, 12, uh, seven hours after that. Now, in certain conditions when food is not as plentiful, this L2 larva can actually enter what's called a dollar stage. Okay? This dollar stage can persist for months at a time until food is uh, back to plentiful levels. All right? So again, the C. elegans has a very quick and short lifespan and a very quick life cycle. Again, it lives for about three weeks. The life cycle is about three days. Okay, so if within basically a week or so, you can have a plate full of worms. Obviously, mice have a longer gestation period when they produce, reproduce. All right, so you see C. elegans, you see a mouse, and you see us. So I'm sure most of you are wondering, you know, there's no way in hell that a mouse can tell me, can tell me research questions about us, because we have nothing like us, right? Worms, mice, there's nothing like us. But what's the one similarity that all these life forms have? Nervous system. Nervous system, but think more basic. Like, what are we made up of? Multicellular. What else? Who said that? Right, DNA. DNA, that's the thing. DNA, as we all know, nucleic acid, some chromosomes, and what are those specific chromosomal segments that code for a protein called? Genes, right. So that's the thing that links all these three different types of animals and other animals as well, genes. All right, as I go through my talk, you're gonna find out that C. elegans has the same type of genes that human beings have. They're just slightly different, but they do the same thing. Now, initiation of BC research in C. elegans started soon after the genome was sequenced back in 1998. 
Um, after the sequence in the genome, they found those proteins that had high homology to human beings. One of these proteins are what are called fatty acid transporters. Fatty, fatty, fatty acid transporters transport long chain fatty acids intracellularly across the cell membrane. So you can actually take a C. elegans fatty acid transporter, you can put it in a vector, and you can actually put it into human cells, and it would do the same thing that the human fatty acid transporter does. So you see here, this is um, um, fatty acid uptake measured by body piece staining. So this is, these, are, these three are mice fatty acids, fatty acid transporter, and this last one is the C. elegans on um, fatty acid transporters. So you can see, we can put a C. elegans protein into a human cell, and it will do the same thing that the human protein does. Um, C. elegans regulates fats and lipids in very similar mechanisms, just like human beings do. Okay? Um, many of the crucial regulators of lipid homeostasis that are seen in mammals also occur in C. elegans. Um, the neuroendocrine regulators of fat and food related behaviors, you have various proteins in that category. The various proteins that regulate fat transport, I'm sorry if that's a little vague, you can't see. Um, also, you have peripheral regulators of fat storage, various proteins that do that. The C. elegans have the same protein that are found in human beings. Um, one, one, interesting, one interesting thing about C. elegans is that it has a transparent body. Okay? As a result, you can see the cells very easily with just a dissection microscope. Okay? So this is, um, you can actually see visualization of the lipids in C. elegans. C. elegans don't have adipocytes like human beings do. Be, beings. Um, what they do is, is that they store lipid droplets inside the intestine. Also, they store lipid droplets inside the cuticle, which is the covering of the worm. So they don't have adipocytes, all right? They just simply store lipid droplets inside their bodies. And then you can stain these lipid droplets with various dyes. This red color is from a dye called Nile Red. Here's the chemical structure seen here. So because they have a transparent body, you can simply um, stain the fat that's inside the cells and just uh, visually see it without having to peel back the skin or anything like that because its body is clear, it's transparent. All right. um, so I'm going to start briefly about fat and sugar synthesis and breakdown. So fats, they're in the family of the triglycerides or phospholipids, and glycogen are usually broken down to um, acetyl-CoA, which is the uh, TCA cycle, and that TCA cycle is used to generate ATP, which I'm sure most of you, well, at least the people in my class should know, ATP is the energy molecule. Okay, ATP is the molecule that the cell, that your cells use um, for a lot of the processes that occur in your cell. Um, also, um, sugars and fats can be synthesized in a, in a form of triglycerides or glycogen. All right, so you can go the opposite way. Fatty acids and glucose can be synthesized into storage forms such as glycogen and um, triglycerides. So these pathways that you're seeing here, these are the same pathways occur in C. elegans. Right? So there again, that's another similarity. All right? C. elegans have to synthesize glycogen and triglycerides just like we do. Now, insulin resistance is when your body, even though it's producing enough insulin, the cells have somehow no longer respond to it. Okay? Insulin, again, is secreted by the pancreas in response to high glucose levels in the blood. Insulin resistance occurs when, again, you have enough insulin in the body, but somehow your cells are not responding to the insulin present. And so insulin, a lot of times, um, Insulin resistance will actually lead to type 2 diabetes. Okay? We all know that type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Type 1 is when you don't produce any insulin and you have to inject yourself with insulin. Type 2 is when you have enough insulin, your body just doesn't respond to it. 
So usually those things just have to adjust their diet accordingly. They can't eat as much sugary or high carbs in their diet. Um, insulin resistance is commonly associated with obesity. Okay, you produce some. You, you basically, as you as your fat cells increase, the insulin mechanism inside your body no longer responds because you become basically desensitized to insulin, and that's where insulin resistance comes about. Okay. Right. So. One of the major pathways that are related to obesity that have been studied in CRDs is the insulin signaling pathway. Okay? So on the left hand side is the pathway in CRDs. On the right hand side is the pathway seen in mammals. Okay? So there's a high degree of conservatism between the mammals and CRDs as it relates to insulin signaling. Okay? Um, when you mutate the insulin receptor, which is DAV2 in CRDs, this causes CRDs to accumulate fat more. All right, so there's that um, red stain that I showed you earlier. In DAV2 mutants, this accumulates to a higher degree. All right, so this same mutation, DAV2 is a DAV2 is a CRDs homolog of the insulin receptor. So this same mutation was seen in a morbidly obese 14 year old patient. She had the same type of DAV2. Insulin receptor mutation that DAV2 mutants have. And she showed the same phenotype. So, again, that's, a, that's a, another way of showing you similarity between sea organs and mammals. All right? The same, the same person had a DAV2 mutation, was morbidly obese. This DAV2 is DAV2 mutation in sea organs, again, leads to high degree of fat accumulation. So CRDs can also be used to study satiety. Satiety is, when, satiety is that feeling of being full. So it means you're satiated. Usually you stop eating. Um, in mammals, satiety is controlled by various signals from the GI tract and from adipose tissue. Right? So satiety usually results in a sequence of specific behaviors. Stop eating or termination of meals. Usually after a big meal, most of us stop moving around as much. Um, you know, go back to Thanksgiving after you eat Thanksgiving dinner. Most of us, at least I do, I know I just go to the couch and you know, don't bother me for about an hour or so because I'm a little good to you. Um, so you have use after meal, you have reduced locomotion, and then also a lot of animals after a big meal will either rest or sleep. Okay. So these are neurological behaviors that usually result from safety signals that the brain receives from the GI tract and from adipose tissue. Right. So we can actually use C. organs to study safety. Right. C. organs has a mouth, just like we do, this different shape. Um, and so it actually varies its eating by varying its pumping rate of the pharynx. Okay. So this green part right here is the pharynx of the C. organs, and you can actually see it here in the actual live animal. So the sea organs will actually vary its feeding by varying the pumping rate of the pharynx. And hopefully the video will work. The only one I could find was on YouTube. So let's see here. So you can see that pumping, that's not the heart, okay? This is the and it's pumping. Okay? So usually when there's a lot of food present, this pumping rate will increase. And then when there's little to no food present, um, I don't know why it goes to that, but it just does. All right. Then when there's little to no food present, um, it still pumps, but it doesn't, just, it doesn't pump just as fast. Okay? So you can, again, use, say, you can use the evidence to study safety. Right? So quiescent behavior, again, is, is associated with the stopping of food intake. And this has been studied. This has been um, equated in the high species. So this, this room right here is just now moving. But you can study quiescent behavior. Um, basically, what you do is you fast the worm for 12 hours, meaning you put it in the plate with no bacteria. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention. Worms feed on bacteria. Okay, They just eat bacteria. So 
This worm has, will starve for 12 hours and then allow to refeed for another few hours after refeeding. They'll live to see if the worm is satiated. And satiated is basically when it doesn't move for 10 seconds or more. Okay, so now this worm is starting to move after 10 seconds, so it's considered satiated. All right. Um, so again, quiescent behavior is again associated with cessation of food intake, and this has been studied in sea elephants and also higher animals. So quiescence can actually be induced by feeding sea elephants what's called high quality food. Okay, so you're probably asking if they eat this bacteria, what's considered high quality bacteria? Right. High quality bacteria is basically bacteria that reproduces at a quicker rate. Okay. Um, so these two strains of bacteria, the HB101 is a strain of E. coli, and the Comomonas is a different type of bacteria. So these are considered high quality bacteria. So this is the high quality food. The DA837 is a different strain of E. coli, which doesn't grow as fast, so it's considered low quality. Okay. So when you feed the worms low quality bacterial food, you don't have as much um, quiescent worms. Okay, it's sort of the same with us when we eat so-called um, good food or food that has, I'm sorry, food that has empty calories per se. We can eat a lot of it because it has empty calories. We don't feel as full, so we usually you know we usually still go eat, still find somewhere to eat. But you know, good quality food, usually food that's high in fiber. Our carbohydrates usually gives us what? A full feeling, so we usually most of us feel satiated. All right. Um, quiescence is also dependent on the nutritional status of the worm as well. So E2 is a type of mutant, and these mutants have 50% of the pumping rate. And again, the pumping rate is refers to the pharyngeum pumping. So the E2 mutants have uh, the pumping rate 50% of the wild type of normal worms. And so you can see that the E2 means don't um, the interquiescence as um, much as the wild type worms. The Act 5 means these are means that have um, a mutation that doesn't allow them to absorb nutrients into their intestines as well as the wild type. Okay? So they can eat all they want, but since they can't absorb nutrients into their intestine, they're going to still feel hungry. So these Act 5 mutants don't enter quiescence as much as the wild type mutants. So again, we can use our studies to study, to study safety just like you do in mice and rats. Right. Um, in rodents, fasting and refeeding evokes a specific behavioral sequence of safety. Okay. Usually the, um, the mice are fasted and then they're allowed to refeed at litem. And so after, usually after fasting, they eat a lot initially, and then usually they usually take off or stop eating. Okay, so does the same does the same type of behavior occur in worms? Yes, it does. So the first graph, graph A, these worms again were starved and then allowed to refeed, and then as you can see initially, they um, the feeding rate drastically increased and then starts to taper off. They start to start to feel full again, and so they stop, you know, stop is eating as much. Also, you can measure this uh, satiety as far as fluorescence intensity of GFP bacteria in um, inside the worm. So again, my class, we did a transformation experiment where we put GFP inside the bacteria, and then you can see the cells grow. Same thing happens here with the worms. You put GFP into the bacteria, the worms eat it. The GFP will actually show up in the worms. The green GFP stands for green fluorescent protein. I'm sorry. Okay. So you can see here, um, initially after refeeding, that you have a high amount of GFP, and then as time goes on, the GFP decreases, meaning that the worms have lowered their food intake. Um, again, the feeding rate measured again by the pumping of the pharynx. Initially, again, is high. As soon as the refeeding is allowed, and then as time proceeds, it decreases. Quiescence has an inverse relationship. Usually, after refeeding, the worms are not quiescent, 
But as time goes on, the quiescence increases. And again, um, you can measure quiescence duration, again, where initially it's not as much, and then it tapers off, and then roughly about 24 hours after refeeding, worms start to eat again, and so they become less quiescent. Now, sea elephants are not just these mindless animals that go around just feeding bacteria all the time until they die. They actually exhibit complex food eating behaviors. Okay? So sometimes sea elephants um, will make a decision whether to dine alone or with others. And this decision is determined by a homologue of a human protein called neuropeptide Y. Okay? So this homologue of neuropeptide Y. These mutants usually would go from eating alone to eating with other worms. Okay? Just like we do sometimes. Okay? Usually if you eat a meal and then your friends call you up, hey, why don't you come out and eat it with us? You know, even though you're full, you go out with your friends, yeah, you have this peer pressure to eat even though you're full. Right? So the same type of behavior can still happen in the CR because you can put an individual worm on a plate by itself, it will eat the bacteria, and then these mutants, you can then take these worms and put them with other worms, and then they will still continue to eat, even though they've been satiated before on the other plate. <laughs> so sea elephants again exhibit the same type of fear behaviors, just like human beings do. Um, we can also look at um, fat accumulation in hypoxic environments. Usually those populations that live at higher altitude, the altitude tends to be shorter in stature. They also tend to be a little more, more girthier, if you want to use that word. All right. Um, obviously, it doesn't apply to every person in the population. I'm sure there are healthy people out there in Denver, and um, I've seen some of them. So. Um, but with uh, elephants also sort of adapts to hypoxia are regions of low oxygen in the same way. So in, when sea elephants is grown in the atmosphere of low oxygen, it increases, this, it increases the production of this protein called SPD1. This is SPD1 stands for sterile binding protein. Again, there's a homolog of this in human beings. Right? So and when sea elephants is grown in a low oxygen environment, Again, using the Nile red, red staining, you can see that you have a higher degree of fat accumulation inside the worm compared to a normal oxygen environment. Okay? So again, this is another example showing the similarities as far as hypoxic environments between human beings and C. elegans. Right. Um, also, the various uh, um, Therapeutic drugs out there that may either cause you to lose weight or gain weight. Um, some people who suffer from schizophrenia, schizophrenia take drugs such as clozapine, and one side effect of clozapine is weight gain. Okay. Um, if you know somebody who has to take anti-psychotic drugs, usually a lot of times one of the side effects is weight gain. All right. And then, so you see the same thing in C. elegans. Right. We don't know if these worms are schizophrenic or not, but we're giving, we're giving the drug anyway. So here's a control worm, and then when the worm is treated um, with um, clozapine or is a um, similar drug here, this dark banding is uh, Sudan black, which again stains lipids. So Sudan black stains lipids just like now red. And you can see when these worms are giving, giving the um, antipsychotic drugs. We have an a higher degree of fat accumulation. Okay, so these the same side effects you see in human beings as far as weight gain occurs in worms as well. All right. So, in conclusion, there's a lot more that needs to be learned about obesity, and obviously, and so the hope is that the use of C. elegans will speed up this learning process. Um, C. elegans. Uh, should be used for initial screening of compounds or various genes before we start looking at mice and obviously before we get to human beings. And so this, this, this use of C. elegans 
this, as far as recent research, showed that we showed the time period between um, when we were discovering um, new drugs or new ways to help fight obesity. Um, again, CRDs is a tiny worm. It's not, since it's not a vertebrate, you don't have to have a committee meeting before using it. Okay? You can grow them at your, grow them at your leisure, and then you can just kill them without somebody knocking on your door saying, Why did you kill the worms? So, um, so CRVs also has a short lifespan and reproduces quickly. Again, this will aid in um, speeding up research projects. Okay, you can get a lot of you can get a lot of data in a short amount of time because of the short lifespan and because it reproduces quickly. Um, so these attributes should make an excellent um, transition. Help CRVs make an excellent transition from in vitro methods methods to uh, methods that are, that are going to be used in higher animals and human beings. Um, also, human, and also, CRVs is a lot cheaper to maintain. Again, you can get thousands of worms on a small petri dish. They simply eat bacteria, which don't cost a whole lot. And um, you don't need a special, special housing facility to house the worms. Okay. So for those of you who are the seniors, if you make it out of my class, um, if you think of research projects, um, this um, basically actively recruiting students to uh, perform various research projects using CRVs. Um, those of you who have who are BS majors, I believe, have to do a research project. Um, if you just want to do a research project, just do one, you can still come see me as well. Okay? So I'm hoping to have this started up by next fall, um, and hopefully by next summer. I'm hoping to get some money so I can have a summer internship program as well. Uh, don't hold me to that, but that's my hope. So thank you, and I'll try to answer any questions that you may have. Cerebral nervous system is a little more simpler than human beings. Um, however, the you know the behaviors, various behaviors, whether it's mating or eating, are controlled by nerves that function in similar pathways compared to human beings. So there is similarity as far as the nervous system is related. Mutation of neuro, this mutation of this new mutation of neuropeptide Y homologue again this affects the behavior pattern. Okay, so it's still it's still much needs to be learned as far as exactly why they choose to eat by eat, choose to eat with, with the other ones even though after they fed. Um, now whether it has something to do with the other ones being present, might not be in the food later right on. Um, I don't think that's really the case because again these ones are allowed to feed by themselves and get full. So just being put on the plate with other worms really shouldn't ideally uh, make these worms eat more. Right? So this mutation basically has caused some type of change in behavior that is that doesn't doesn't sense that it's full and doesn't have to eat just because other worms are around. There's, there's a paper, um, it was, I couldn't get it online, um, basically, because we don't have subscriptions to their... Right, they, they looked at the worms, like when they transferred the worms to the other plate with the, um, with the animals, they looked at the pumping rate, again, of the worm that was, that was fed before it was put to the other plate. And it was the same, this was around the same pumping rate as the worms that were all on the plate. Yeah, 
I mean, the, the bad tooth medium that I mentioned earlier, bad medium, again, accumulates fat to a higher degree than normal medium. There are also other genes um, that are involved. I didn't want to go through a whole list of genes, but yeah, there are, you know, obviously a genetic makeup, whether you see our genes are human, are human, will play a role in whether or not how much you eat and how much of fat, of fat that you accumulate. Yeah, their lifespan is shorter. They have a shorter lifespan. Yeah. And also, I'm sorry, also depending on the mutation, um, some of them have reduced reproducibility. They don't produce as many eggs as well. So, yeah. Has there a circulation like No, the wild worms don't have circulation like we do. No, you can't because the hermaphrodite, hermaphrodite will produce clones of itself. So if the hermaphrodite has a mutation in a gene, its progeny will have the same mutation. It's only when, I mean, you can control. No, it doesn't, it doesn't complicate it. No. Most of the time, genetic surgery is done with hermaphrodites because they produce clones of themselves. Parameters live, so are there key parameters that you can observe live so that you can put together for your monitoring these parameters live to see what's happening in terms of their key parameters as far as like size that's changing? Yeah, I mean, you could, um, again, nowadays some of the fancy places have these uh, computers and cameras set up where you actually would have to be there and it'll measure stuff like pumping weight for you. It also measure things like locomotion. And because it has a transparent body, it also can measure increase in intensity of dyes as they accumulate inside the body because they're transparent. So basically, you just put the worm on a plate, put it underneath the camera. There's software that will actually trace the outline of the worm. And so if you want to do a study that involves like hours at a time, you don't have, you don't have to sit there physically and watch the worm. It'll, it'll do it for you. Yeah. So you can do that with LabVIEW, and uh, and so you just actually need a computer. Right. The, the LabVIEW, which we have, so we can do that here for you. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Thank you.